Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Shamika. If you're new here, make sure you tap that subscribe button and then hit the bell icon in case you want to be notified whenever I upload a video. And for those of you that don't know who I am, I am a journalist and my work has been seen in soultrain.com, um, Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine, Vanity Fair. Um, I've been on Shondaland.com, WeTV.com, and the list goes on and on and on. So basically, I'm qualified to be doing interviews, okay? So anyway, on this channel, check the rhymes. I am doing interviews, bringing you some of your favorites, people you haven't probably even heard about, thought about in a while, just basically whoever I want to talk to, right? And then of course, I'm still going to sprinkle in some of those vlogs from MoFo Chronicles because I know you guys love those. So let's get started with today's show. So today I am welcoming Grammy Award winning producer Troy Taylor. Now some of you are kind of like, Troy Taylor, why does that sound familiar? Well, because you've heard so many of his songs over the years. You've heard like his work on Boys to Men's first album. You've heard Tyrese's Sweet Lady. You know, he's been kind of everywhere. So I'm hoping that he's gonna give us some tea on Aretha Franklin, Patti LaBelle, the OJs, and then tell us how he's bridging the gap between the old school and the new school sound to put out music with Jacquees and other artists. So stay tuned, you don't wanna miss today's show. Thank you, Troy, for joining me. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. And happy New Year. Um, listen, so I had no idea that you are responsible for so many of my favorite songs. Like, I had, I had no idea. So let's, let's, let's go back because I know that this year you are celebrating 30 years in the game, right? Yes. So tell mm -hmm. me just, you know, I know it's going to be hard to, to pinpoint one or two things, but what has been the biggest highlight for you? I would say the the definitely the biggest highlight in my career would definitely have to be Aretha Franklin, like working with her, like working closely with her, winning a Grammy with her. Um, the interview where she said I was an awesome, great writer and producer. I mean, that's the queen. Like the, the next best thing to that to me is Quincy Jones. Wow. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know that you could probably top those two. Those are like royalty. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What would you say has been the biggest lesson that you've learned in the past 30 years? Um, the biggest lesson I would say, um, because the, the, it's, it's one of the biggest lessons. I can't say the biggest lesson, but one of the biggest lessons is really protect your mental health. And I say that because, you know, there's so many hills, peaks and valleys and so many ups and downs and so many areas in your life when you live life regularly that you can really fall into either depression or mm -hmm. something that could take you away from what you love and you don't even, you're not even seeing it coming. Like for me, it was a divorce. Like I, you know, during the making of Ready album for Trey Songs. I was 40 and I was going through a divorce and, and I couldn't understand why it wasn't, it wasn't my divorce. It wasn't something that I was particularly in control of. Mm -hmm. However, I was in control of making sure that third album had to be flawless. Right. You know what I mean? So I had to protect my anger that I was feeling. Um, and the, I, I, I don't want to say I was depressed because I'm not a depressed type person, but that had to be the lowest that I've ever been in my life. Mm -hmm. So, and then what makes it worse is that I couldn't show it because I had too many young producers around me and uh, the responsibility of Trey's career. So I couldn't really express it, which kind of made it a little hard, well, a lot harder. Mm -hmm. So I would say that because if you don't watch it, you can actually slip into some type of mental depression, as we see a lot of people do. Um, no matter how much money you have, success you have, that that has no, that has really no favorites. Like it doesn't, 
it doesn't it, it's it's for everybody anybody and everybody so i would say protecting your mental health absolutely i agree you got to protect your peace your mental health and i yes. think one of the one of the things i've seen a lot on social media is people are are encouraging people to seek therapy um before it was kind of taboo and a lot of um, especially in the black community people are like you don't don't tell our business. Don't go out, yeah. you know, talking about this and that, you know, find a way but to you deal know what, with it, go to you know, church, put some you know holy oil thing? on you, <laughs> something. You know, you know what the funny thing about that is? They say don't tell your business, but they on, inter in, in, you know, internet telling their business. Hello? Right, exactly. The, the very thing that they say don't do, that's the first thing they think to go to. Rather exactly. private with someone who could help you. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, they'll go, they'd rather go on internet risk being even more depressed by one comment that they don't like or slips them into some other direction of depression rather than just go somewhere private and talk to somebody who's professional. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that I think is a, an important lesson that you, that you have yes. learned over the years. Um, now for some people that may not understand what you do as a producer, because I, I didn't realize that people thought that all producers, are made equal. You know what I mean? Like they think that, like, cause I was a news producer for over 15 years and I can't mm -hmm. tell you the amount of people that would be like, listen to my music. Maybe you could produce my music. And I'm like, I write news scripts. What are you talking about? So <laughs> kind of <laughs> you tell them what a music producer does because these fools out here <laughs> just randomly you put producer in your bio and they think, Oh, you can help. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, a music producer is basically someone who um, puts together the music that uh, a song or project or uh, whatever it is that, ne that, that needs music. Their job is to make sure all the ingredients line up uh, musically. The right song, track, the right song, the right, you know, vocals, the right everything that comes together to make it what it needs to be it's the producer's job to bring it all together so that it's executed properly okay what were there any producers that kind of influenced you like they're like maybe give me your top three um i'd say quincy jones um jam and lewis which will be one mm -hmm. <laughs> teddy riley which will be yeah so those three. Okay. Okay. So um, walk me through kind of what your creative process is when you're in the studio with an artist. When I'm in the studio with an artist, I make sure, um, well, it's a couple of things. Okay. So before the recording, I make sure I at least know a little bit about their personality so that I can see how to um, guide them. A lot of these kids are sensitive. Um, I tend to be a little hard, so I have to make sure that I don't be too hard and they mess, you know, like get throw attitudes and get in their feelings. <laughs> Go um, to social media. <laughs> basically. And um, the next thing is just making sure uh, their body posture coming up to the mic, be it sit down or stand up, that it's prepared, that they're in a position to project and utilize their tone and, em and emotions for whatever the song calls for. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to keep my eye out on them. So I tend to not use vocal booths. I don't like vocal booths. Um, I tend to have the artist with the mic sitting or standing right next to me as I record so that I can watch their body language and make sure that um, it's, it's, it, it's the right posture for, you know, the song okay. or the vocals. Okay. That makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Let's backtrack a little bit. So you started out as an artist. So what, yeah. you know, an artist signed to Motown. So how did you kind of, what was that aha moment when you're like, yeah, I want to go into producing and, and songwriting? Um, the aha moment with me for, for me was when, as I was in the middle of, or really at the beginning of making my project at Motown, um, I had met that, you know, this group that, you know, these kids that were amazing and they, you know, working with them from the ages of 15 to 17 and a year later within that working with them, they go multi-platinum and known all over the world as boys to men made me rethink like, 
that's that's that can happen and I can still use the skills, the things that I love to do without being the front person. Mm-hmm. So the aha moment was, wait, nah, I think I'd rather <laughs> be behind the scenes because uh, I don't think I'll do the artist thing pretty good because you gotta, you gotta, you gotta kind of like be prepared for people and their personalities and you can't really snap and be snippety and you can't be too much of anything because you want them to play your music or you mm. want them to, you know, add you to a show. Or kind of, so you have to watch what you say, how you say it. You're dealing with sensitive people as an artist. You got to, you got to be on your piece. Nah, I'll be behind the scenes. I'm good in and out the studio. I can go anywhere I want. Nobody really knows who I am. I can live. Okay. I know that when I saw that you had um, done some work on, um, the, the first album, um, I was cracking up because I remember, you remember cassette singles? I'm dating myself right mm-hmm. now. So I, I tend to, if I hear a song on the radio from that album, I only know the, the snippets that were on the back of the cassette single because I was mm-hmm. like, I'll sing the first verse and then I'm like, I don't know the rest of the song. So anyway, right. that just cracked me up because I forgot about that, that, you know, those, that during that time that those, those cassette singles were big and, and all that mm-hmm. stuff and the snippets on the back. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've worked with a lot of legends, like you mentioned before, Aretha Franklin. So I'm just going to go through and mention some names and, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about each artist or working with them or you know, mm-hmm. some tea that you want to spill, anything that, <laughs> that you want to talk about. Um, regarding these artists. So we're going to, mm-hmm. since I mentioned Aretha, let's start with Aretha Franklin. Um, Aretha, you know, she she was so on point. She knew the lyrics. She knew the melodies. She knew what she was going to do with it. And I, working with her was like, wow, now I can go back in my mind and, and think of how it was in the 60s and the 70s when they really just knew their music before they went into the studio to record. Mm-hmm. Um, and just dealing with, you know, working with these kids that don't even listen to the demo before they come in. They ain't never heard the song ever. Then they get in the booth. Now, today, they got their phones. So, you know, they're looking at their phones on the internet while they're recording vocals that they don't know the lyrics or the melody to. And just remembering how Aretha was. She was so sharp, so on point. It really made me feel like that's why she's the queen. Tell me, did she come in the studio wearing a fur? I'm just, in my head, she did. <laughs> No, no, she actually didn't. Uh, the first time I recorded with her was in her home, actually. Uh, they turned the dining room into like a little little booth and they, you know, made some blankets and they put it up because she just wanted to be at home. Um, and then the ne- the, to- the other time that we were in the studio, she was just regular, um, nothing fancy, um, actually kind of looked like a, a church mother, kind of <laughs> like in, in a church mother in the kitchen. I have a picture with her. That I always, it's just funny because I always say she looks like the church lady. Oh, yeah. But nothing grand <laughs> at all. She wasn't grand like that. Okay. All right. Um, Whitney Houston. Whitney was very, very, very hilarious. Very hilarious. Like, super duper hilarious. In 2003, I um, recorded while working with her on her Christmas project, I recorded our session so you hear our interaction with each other and it is hilarious like (laughs) it is really 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 hilarious and funny and just showing her personality and how she was and the most special thing about that is it's mine right so nobody in the world has it you know what i mean right um so but she was she was she was beautifully ghetto That's all I have to say. She's beautifully ghetto because her face and everything else looks one way, but what comes out of her mouth <laughs> was not the princess she was. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about working with the Isley brothers? Man, Ron Isley, uh, Ernie Isley. Um, I got a lot of good stories from Ron, um, just hearing how things were back in the day when they were coming up. Um, but just working with that legendary vocal, like that voice. I never, you know, growing up, I never thought, I never thought I would work with Aretha. I never thought I would work with Isley Brothers. Like that wasn't something 
some people are so royal that you don't even dare want to work with them. Right. That, if that makes sense, you know, it's yeah. like, no, nah, no, nah, they're, they're them. They, I, I, you know, I work with every, but and not them. Cause they don't, they don't, you know, they don't need me or I can't, you know, I, I don't know. I can't, but with Ron Isley, um, the first time I worked with him, he was just getting over that stroke he had. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of hard working with him because one side of his mouth was kind of like stiff and he couldn't really, he couldn't really open it up like he wanted to. But uh, I, it, it ended up being three songs on the baby making album that they did mm-hmm. and just came here to chill was the single off that album. So it came out really, really awesome. But later on after that, I ended up doing a um, duet with him and Patti LaBelle. And a lot of people don't know about this song called Gotta Go Solo. And um, we had to do it. I had to do Ron in LA and I had to do Patty in Philly. Uh, and then I had to make it seem like they were in the studio together. Oh, wow. um, but now a little T, a little T T. Okay. I'm, they used to, I'm listening. They used, they, used to, <laughs> they used to like date a little bit back in the day day. Like Ron told me some things. I'm like, oh. okay. Oh. All right. Well, you know, okay. <laughs> I was, they get mad. I, I know Patty would get mad if I <laughs> <laughs> probably fuss me out. But this this is what Ron said. I, I don't know. So <laughs> it's true. I don't know. This is Ron told me. You know, a little dating thing going on back in the day. Um, but yeah, the song came out awesome. It was great. And even though it wasn't something that you know blew up or did you know extremely well, for me as an experience, right. Um, and to hear the song and hear them interacting with each other, knowing that they weren't in a room together, was the challenge for me, and it, and I killed it. Wow, that's amazing! I Actually, I was so about awesome. to bring up Patty Labelle. I wanted to know, have you had her cooking, and can you get me an invite to her house for Thanksgiving? That is my goal. <laughs> well, no, I never, I never. Um, we talked about she talked about cooking all the time, but I've never had her cooking. But she's a fellow Gemini. So me and Patty really, really got along really super well. Um, she's definitely a diva in the sense of don't mess with her. Like mm-hmm. she'll cut you like in a heartbeat. <laughs> and Aretha was like that as well. Um, but Patty, again, sharp, really attentive, uh, pays attention to detail. And she knows her voice. She knows mm-hmm. how to use her voice. But she's always been great. Always been great. I worked with her a few times as well. Okay. Um, and what about the invite? <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, I got to get one first. <laughs> <laughs> I can't invite somebody I ain't invited. <laughs> oh, man. So, and you you really helped Trey Songs along with his career, you know, by signing him, you know, to your um, company. And then, and then he went over to Atlantic. Talk about working with Trey. Well, Trey um, met him when he was 15. And at that time, you know, in high school, in his in Petersburg, he was basically like a local rapper, you know, just rapping and stuff. And he wanted to see if he could sing. Uh, and then that's how I met him, basically to uh, listen to him and give my opinion. But in listening to him, it kind of went in another direction because as soon as I heard him sing, it was more like, hey, okay, you got a little bit of a tone. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wasn't a bad looking kid so in my head it's like if you learn how to use your tone you might be a little something mm-hmm. so how about I do that and basically the arrangement was um, let's see that was August 2000 so he was back getting ready to go back to school the arrangement basically was when he had breaks you know school breaks uh, he would come back to Jersey. I lived in Jersey at the time and just follow me, you know, around, go to the studio with me. Um, I would show him some things and just teach him some things. And then in the summer, he came to stay with his stepfather, which was like eight minutes away from my house and just learned everything. So by the time he graduated out of high school, he was already, we were already like in the process of pushing forward with who he is now. Okay. And and yeah. I have to say one thing about him, another thing, is that he was the only artist to date 
that listened to every single thing I said to do. Like wow. everything, no matter what, there was no huh, there was no why, there was no, I don't know, man, like you think it's dope, I think I can do it. You know, it was mm-hmm. whatever I said, he did it. Up mm-hmm. until he was 22. <laughs> well, well it me. paid off though. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, definitely paid off. But for the most part, he definitely listened to everything in the beginning stages of his whole learning and everything. He listened to everything I said to do. Um, even when it didn't make sense to him, he still did it anyway. Okay. Um, so like I was saying, you had worked with a lot of legends and then even working with Trey Songs, but now you're working with more like newer artists. So, you know, I know some producers don't want to work with new artists. So what makes you want to work with new artists and, and how do you work with new artists trying to stay true to your, you know, R&B sound and formula and then incorporate it into whatever they've got going on? Because, you know, music is just very different these days. It's definitely a challenge because the kids don't study the way, you know, my generation studied music and they sure don't know the value of the music. They put the value of the music second and the social media first Mm -hmm. and not understanding that if it's not for the music, then nobody would even know you. Right. So you got this twisted. Um, But what makes me want to work with them is I feel like rather than to complain, I'll educate. Okay. And if I can educate them, it'll make my job a lot easier. Plus it'll, it'll bring me back to doing the music that I love. Um, Expecting them to do it would be stupid because they don't know how to do it. So if they're taught, then we could start there. So that makes me like more passionate to want to work with a Jacquees or Osiris um, to, to kind of like educate them musically and to challenge their ear to want to have a little bit more quality in music. And for both of them, they love R&B music. So it's not, it wasn't hard to convince them at all uh, to do. Um, but it is definitely something that uh, uh, became a passion to say, if I teach them, guide them, help them dive into the generation and, and guide them with, with, uh, the music that, that I feel like, you know, brings music back to the quality of what we're used to, then it would be better than sitting on the sideline talking about them and being angry, expecting them to do something again, that they don't know what they're doing. Right. So were you in on the Jacquees saying he was the king of R&B? <laughs> well, I mean, I say, first and foremost, I believe that no one can tell you who you are, but you could tell people who you are. Yep. And if you feel like you're the king, then okay, you have the right to feel that way. Mm-hmm. We don't have to agree. <laughs> right. <laughs> but if you want to say that, okay then it's fine. I'm not mad at him for saying that. That's what he feels he is. That's what he feels he is. True. It's not until he asked me to agree with him that would be, you know, but he said of this generation and right now what people have to understand that is that there's a lot of rappers. There's not a lot of singers. So he's kind of like standing in in the middle of, you know, not too much competition. That's true. That's true. So he can claim that if he wants. So it ain't that much, you know, it ain't that much to claim, but he (laughs) set up his generation. So he was very specific on that. And so I have to say, well, if you really look at what's going on, um, Chris is not of his generation. Trey's not of his generation. Neil's not of his generation. Mario's not. Oh, Mario's not. Um, He got it. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) He got it. So I don't even know why anybody was mad. (laughs) <laughs> this generation, all the generation, because of social media that's why they were mad <laughs> yes yeah 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 okay um so what what else are you working on what are you working on this year since this is the big 30 what are you working on this year um and i'm not really big on celebrations and stuff i suck like i didn't well i was going through my divorce at 40 and at 50 i just chilled I actually um took a homeless kid out to to get some clothes <laughs> it, it turned out that way I just like took them shopping um, but um, right now I'm on the campaign of mayor of r and it's something okay. that I just made up um, but uh, I'm creating it now 
and right you're telling us artists. who you are <laughs> exactly exactly um um, I'm on a campaign for just, you know, um, getting the quality of music back. And I say back because it's not where, where it was before. And that's bridges, harmonies, chord progressions, um, and just giving, getting it back to the feeling and the emotions. You know, the music really, you could, you could tell, you could remember where you were when you heard Thriller. You know right. what I mean? Or if you hear Rock With You, you know where you were when you first heard it. You know what I mean? Music doesn't really do that to us anymore because it's so short lived. Right. It's so it's so about that moment, and it's like when you're done with that moment, that moment's gone. Mm -hmm. But the music I grew up on, it wasn't about the moment. It was about an event. It was about a time, an era. So trying to get music back into that. That's my new thing uh, that I want to do for 2020. Um, I have an artist, Devin Culture, that I'm working with. And he's a soulful artist, uh, like a young Maxwell. You know, okay. amazing falsetto. Um, and I have a, a, just a few artists, I mean, young artists that I'm grooming and producers and writers. So I'm doing exactly what I've always been doing. But okay. I'm just kind of like turning it up a little bit more. Okay. Um, so here at Check the Rhymes, I am all about, you know, um, gratitude, positive vibes, all that stuff. So I want to ask, this is the last question, by the way, but I wanted to ask, what, what affirmation do you tell yourself daily just to, to get through your day? What keeps you going? Um, the purpose of why God graced me and blessed me with the ability that I have, the talent, um, it is not for me. It would never was. It's, it's technically for praise and worship. If we want to get like to the whole helm of why we have our gifts and talents, mm -hmm. but on top of that, it's to help others. We are on this earth to help others. We're not on this earth to help ourselves. That's the whole thing. We are on this earth to help others, and it's through music that my purpose is how I help people. So when I get to a level to where I conquer that level and move to the next level. Going back to list to that the level I conquered, it's only right to help people who are on that level. You know what I mean? Instead right. of looking back on, yeah, I remember that level. Yeah, you'll be all right. They keep it going. No, you're supposed to uplift, help, guide, direct, and that I feel is one of my uh, purposes in life concerning my gifts and talents is to help others discover their gifts and talents and how to master it. So this thing, this music thing, I love it. It's my hobby. It's my job. It's everything, but it's more so for the passion of helping other people discover their gifts and bring it out and show them how to use it and to be all that it can be. Okay. Well, tell people how they can find you on social media or if you've got a website, let us know where we can find you. Um, you can find me on internet, on the internet, on social media, I should say, uh, Instagram, uh, at Troy Taylor TTU, and my Twitter is the same as well. Okay, awesome. Thank you so, so much for joining me. Thank you. I enjoyed this conversation and the tea. <laughs> a little bit, just a little. Just a little, little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's Troy Taylor, you guys, and stay tuned for the next video. Thank you for having me.